Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Annalisa Quinn, and I'm from the IWDP Alumni Association, who is co-sponsoring uh, co this lecture this fine afternoon. Um, I just wanted to introduce our lecturer, uh, Vangala Ram, um, and also welcome you to the Institute of World Politics. Um, so they gave me a few notes. So. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are new, we are a graduate school in national security and international affairs focused on teaching all of the arts of statecraft. We offer five master degree programs and 18 certificate programs. Uh, Van Galeram is a career member of the U.S. Senior Foreign Service, uh, Support, Foreign Service, SFS, based now at the National Intelligence University on senior detail from the State Department. He is a full-time faculty member of the Department of Transnational Issues at NIU. Mr. Ram has been in the U.S. Foreign Service for around 25 years, serving in a wide variety of positions around the world. Prior to the U.S. Foreign Service, Mr. Ram was a military intelligence uh, MI officer in the United States Army. Mr. Ram holds a B.A. from Bard College and a master's degree from Boston University in international relations from the national, uh, and from the National Defense University. He is also, and very importantly, an IWP alumnus, having taken a course at IWP during our very first summer semester in 1992. So, and welcome back. <laughs> And uh, the IWP Alumni Association is very pleased to welcome him here today to discuss diplomacy, statecraft, and the war of ideas. Thank you very kindly, Annalise, for that introduction. And uh, it is a real honor to be here with all of you today as an alum, uh, particularly here at uh, Manat House, which uh, I think is apropos for our topic of conversation since it used to be a part of the Soviet embassy. So uh, from that point of view, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. And uh, I thought that uh, this is a mouthful in terms of a, uh, a lecture title. It's not so much a lecture as a discussion, I should point out, because what I wanted to do is just briefly sketch out for you that um, diplomacy is often construed as sort of action between two state actors, right? That, uh, as you know from your own international relations courses, it gets traced all the way back to the Treaty of Westphalia a few centuries ago. And uh, that's certainly how we construe it today in terms of state-to-state -state relations. That's what diplomacy essentially is. I'd like to talk to uh, everyone today about the uh, need, as I see it, my contention to revise the basic premise of diplomacy to include what we're talking about here at this institute, which is statecraft, and in particular, the war of ideas. And so what I'm, I'm going to suggest is that uh, diplomacy in terms of being just state to state, state is far too limited. And, uh, and so from my point of view, it needs to also include the public dimension, which is public diplomacy as a key component of diplomacy. There was a rather famous uh, foreign service officer, a uh, little more famous than I am, named George Kennan, some of you have heard of, who wrote something called the Long Telegram. This is an antecedent <clears throat> to what I'm proposing, which is a comprehensive long-term strategy to seek and influence foreign opinion, public opinion primarily. Excuse me. <clears throat> so John Lewis Gaddis wrote a uh, seminal biography of George Kennan where he noted that uh, Kennan's telegram crystallized for him the thinking of senior administration officials at that time which was the opening salvo in what became, uh, for many of you, history. Uh, but for me, it was real life, the Cold War. And so it was the opening salvo in terms of what Gaddis called, and this is a quote directly from Gaddis, the medical equivalent of an x-ray penetrating beneath alarming symptoms to yield at first clarity, then comprehension, and finally, by implication, a course of treatment. I'm proposing that, uh, in a sense, we're doing that today as well, because we have uh, in a very real uh, need for a new analysis of our times along similar lines. I'm going to focus a lot of my remarks today about Russia, but this is not uh, unique to Russia. Okay, So what I want to make clear is that while my expertise lies with Russia, this applies equally truly to China, for example, and certainly to ISIS and to other 
uh, organizations and states that we are not particularly fans of, we being the United States and the United States government. So Russian character has certainly played the decisive role in shaping Russian strategic thinking. And that's the principal reason why Putin is so popular, because he has enabled order to be the primary virtue of Russian society today. That's something that ordinary Russians value very, very highly. But Russia is far from a suitable partner for us. When I say us again, I mean the United States and the West. We're not able to address global issues together because Russia is uninterested in integration with us. I want to point out to everyone that Russia is a very unique construct. So that means that we are able to cooperate with Russia occasionally on discrete issues, but there are no shared values, and that's the key, or common vision, and certainly no strategic alliance. And we've called it a strategic alliance in the past. We've called it a strategic partnership. We've called it various names, none of which I think are appropriate to the exact nature of this relationship, which is a transactional relationship for the most part. So I uh, point this out because um, there's another FSO who recently has written a rather longish piece that is a follow-up to uh, the long telegram. His name is Thomas Graham, and I recommend uh, that article to you, uh, also from a fairly realist point of view, about his own contention that uh, that Russia is indeed a country with which we have to do business, but, uh, but it's difficult to do business with on many occasions, because what we're acknowledging now, whether we tacitly admit it or not, is that we're engaged, in a sense, in what I'm calling an information war. So Russians understand this very well. Russians understand that they actively engage and pursue purposefully in disinformation on behalf of something that has come to be known as illiberal democracy. And I say illiberal democracy not in the political sense of the word liberal, but liberal and illiberal in the sense of a set of shared common democratic values that, again, Russia has led the way in opposing. And in fact, Russia is now being emulated by uh, several other countries in Eastern Europe that have used the Russian model to say that they would like to also uh, establish and foment an illiberal democracy. The United States government is singularly ill-equipped to confront the reality of this kind of threat. The Soviets and now the Russians are really adept at adapting and shifting messages to meet whatever their audience needs are, whether it's in Poland, Sweden, or here in the United States. One of the first interim steps that I think we ought to pursue, and I'm, I'm going to recommendations at this point, is to seriously give thought to revitalizing and revigorating our own broadcasting capability, which is a way to reach Russian elites and the public in terms of uh, Radio Liberty and the Voice of America. And again, this is something we used to do very, very well, but we've put much less emphasis on lately. And I think that there's a real requirement to, uh, to reinvigorate it. We can then pursue a strategy of meeting and engaging with an equivalent of uh, Russia today. So obviously Russia today is the gold standard for uh, a propaganda outlet, but uh, I think it's very possible to have an equivalent of that without the propaganda element. Russians have been able to excel at uh, propagating old wine in a new bottle. They have been, and they are now, designed to foment and to deliberately confuse, befuddle, and distract audiences in a very highly calibrated manner. When I say highly calibrated, what I'm talking about is they don't use the same message at the same time in each country. They use a different message in a different country to, to calibrate that message, and they know what's going to appeal very well to those audiences. Russia's aims ought to be very self-evident. They're very clearly designed to erode public support for Euro-Atlantic values by exploiting the ex-intentions and thereby extending Russia's strategic reach by offering Russia the spurier, spurious uh, appearance of legitimacy. Consequently, information warfare that's now conducted by Russia intensifies geopolitical, economic, and for me the key, ideological competition in areas of crucial interest for us, such as the Baltic North and the Black Sea South. Results of these Russian efforts could well be dramatic unless we, that is Europe and the United States, respond. 
Russia's uh, Lizhny Vostok, that's their near abroad, is the key to understanding how this is going to be played out. And I want to say again, it's not unique to Russia. It also is true of China if you look at their doctrine of three warfares. China employs this with real uh, uh, skill and alacrity in terms of the Confucius Institutes that they have established all around the world. But both Russia and the United States contend and maintain to their audiences that the United States is engaged in a brutal and selfish bid for world domination. And then they have Larry King on there to add some panache and, uh, and uh, familiarity to it. Right. So it's a, uh, it's a very odd amalgam. I don't think it'll be any surprise then to anyone here in the audience that uh, I, as a veteran of the United States Information Agency, strongly recommend that the reconstitution of the uh, United States Information Agency be considered. There was an idea that uh, USIA had its, its usefulness uh, ended when the Iron Curtain fell. I don't agree with that. I think the only legitimate means that we have to counter active measures is through the dissemination of unbiased and objective information, just as we did before. The need today is greater than ever. If modern Russian propaganda is, to quote, cynically fact-free, technically adept, and cleverly targeted, as a recent European Union report notes, then that fact, in many cases, is also uh, that it's, it's also enjoyable, only forces us to redouble the efforts that uh, our government and other governments ought to, ought to make. So I'm, I'm proposing, in a sense, that we, we do something really rather old-fashioned that we haven't done in a long time. Uh, but that we ought to consider as a uh, means of of offering an alternative to uh, to propaganda, which is to to propagate our own message, which is again uh, an unbiased and objective message to both elites, to the mass media, and that might mean even employing trolls as they do. Sometimes you have to fight a troll with a troll if it's necessary and required. You all know what trolls are, right? We can talk about that later. But uh, we do require an asymmetrical approach to counter Russia's propaganda, which includes, of course, in, in terms of uh, necessity, at times a military response, but also an economic response. And for me, the most important would be an informational response. And as I say, uh, we did this very effectively before we even engaged in intellectual debate. And I think, again, we need to think about emphasizing how we do that in the, in the sphere of targeting um, elite audiences around the world in an ideological competition that includes uh, the foundation of uh, leading intellectual journals like we had. And there was one called Encounter that, uh, that uh, certainly expressed the opinions and views of people that didn't necessarily sympathize with communists. So, um, you know, perhaps there isn't even one uh, universal answer, but it has to combine the efforts of uh, agencies that might be construed like the USIA. Maybe there's a modern equivalent to that. But I would emphasize broadcasting both television and uh, old-fashioned radio broadcasting because a lot of people still listen to that. And I also think that we need to do much more in the realm of intellectual engagement uh, with elite uh, audiences. And I emphasize elites because we're certainly interested in what the mass think, but we're much more interested in what the elites in most countries think. And so I think that uh, is the uh, foundation for which I'd like to set the stage for a discussion of what I call uh, you know, this nascent war of ideas. So thank you very much, Annalise. And I open the floor to all of you. Thank you. So don't be shy. Any questions, comments? I'm open to anything that is on your minds in terms of this topic today. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Bia Basu. I'm the University of India. I worked with the USMC mm -hmm. yeah. for two years. Congratulations. And, um, <laughs> um, I think um, what I've seen in India, at least in sure. India, is this kind of um, very short term view of mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. uh, public diplomacy is and right. constant chopping and changing sure. of, um, goals and objectives yes. and the constant search for innovation and yes. new ideas. Yes leaves a very fractured image in the minds of your public audiences. Correct. And there is no uh, plan for mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. It's a very appreciative and timely comment. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that you might have served at the embassy in India after the Cold War ended. Yes. Um, you know, you make a very good point. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, public diplomacy is well known for now, at least the way the US government engages in it, is for being very reactive. And uh, you're absolutely right that there, we don't, there is no long-term strategy. I completely agree. That's really one of the points I'm trying to make is that we need to have a mechanism within the government to try to develop this longer range plan because the Russians and others do it. The Russians, the Chinese, and certainly others as well are engaged in that kind of long-term effort that we're very, very bad at. In fact, one of my favorite analogies that all of you have heard, I'm sure, is that we excel at playing checkers while the others are playing chess. You know, checkers is a very transactional kind of game and chess is one that requires uh, being from India, you know, longer term strategy. And it's something that the United States traditionally has not been very good at. We weren't too bad at it during the Cold War because we had to be good at it to counter the Soviets. But since then, we've become very, very bad at it. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Calvin Hershey, Westchester University, and Mark Bennett. Uh, thank you for the talk that I read. Uh, in your opinion, how would you personally define Russian character? Mm -hmm. And since mm -hmm. the uh, official end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. have you seen a change in on the ground mm -hmm. with the uh, population? Thank you very much for the question. So, first of all, thank you again for your service. But uh, I lived in Russia for five years in the Putin period both in St. Petersburg and Moscow. The Russian character is indomitable. In other words, I mean, you know, they can take a level of um, deprivation and endure, endure it far better than any American can ever imagine. So they're tough. They're very, very tough. And I say that because they uh, really are very well suited to the kind of long-range uh, strategy this young lady was asking about. That's their character. That's their nature. And... Um, you know, what I would say is what I noticed, I noticed that among people your age, younger people in Russia, there's a great deal of interest and awareness about the West. They do have access to the internet. They have a lot of curiosity, but they also feel betrayed. Uh, the younger generation in Russia found that the 90s were a period of complete and utter chaos and that they uh, suffered, their own families suffered a great deal from uh, the economic losses that Russia experienced during that 90s. And what they see is that Putin brought not only order, as I mentioned, but also prosperity. So they're very big fans of Putin, and they admire him. And he's created an organization for people, pretty much, uh, you know, most of the people around this table would qualify, called NASHA, mean, meaning ours. And uh, what I noticed is that on a personal level, you know, it's not a lie to say that Putin is, is really a very, very highly popular politician, much more so than we could even imagine. And he's popular not because of sort of any particular actions that he does, although they support those, but because he himself is strong, perceived as strong and very reliable. And that's what they're looking for. Does that help? Absolutely. Okay, sure. Anything else on anyone's mind? Yes, ma'am. So after the Cold War, yes. Of a common enemy, yes, the right? For the EU and USA, also. So, what, in your opinion, what will be this next common, Thank you. common enemy Thank in you. the future? Because, in my opinion, this whole um, problem with short term strategy yeah. and uh, the crisis in Europe uh, nowadays, it's somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, this absence of a common yeah. goal or enemy. Thank you very much again for a very, uh, very insightful question. You know, I think uh, I have to blame us more than anyone else for the current situation. I don't blame any other country. I think that in the end, we're guilty of a great deal of hubris. And, you know, I think some of you for your classes have read this book called The End of History, right? We really believe that. We believe that at the end of the Cold War, we won. That means the Russians lost, and everything is great. What are we talking about, you know? As you point out, that's hardly the case. And if we look at your country, uh, you know, we see that Viktor Orban has back basically established a kind of a new way of defining um, the Central European intellectual sphere with this concept of illiberal democracy, right? He fundamentally rejects Western values as, as he sees them. He, he embraces Christianity, for example. He embraces what he calls traditional values. Those traditional values, unfortunately, have nothing or little to do with what we believe in. So 
um, you know, it's in a way a perversion or a betrayal of uh, of Judeo-Christian values, but he's managed to be very successful in doing it, and I don't think he'll be the only one. I think he, Putin, and others have been able to uh, sort of craft the sphere that exists between uh, what they've perceived as a very liberal West and, um, you know, their old uh, sort of communist past, and it becomes very seductive for a lot of people. I don't know if you've been in touch with people in Hungary recently, but uh, he's, uh, you know, pretty popular, I guess, in, in some ways. And uh, I think it's unfortunate because there isn't uh, really a credible alternative to that. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right that we, we need one. There isn't one right now. So I think we're all pointing to the same need, right? We're pointing to the same requirement that uh, we recognize the symptoms and the malady, but we don't have a cure. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. So thank you. Sir, you had a question. I was going to ask if you think that the Kremlin is trying to turn the Orthodox Christian world into more or less a new Soviet world. I think that's an excellent point. You know, the point that the gentleman brings up is actually a really relevant point because one of the most important and clever things that Putin has done uh, in terms of being a politician is to completely co-opt the church. So when he's selling, even for example, the idea of Russian engagement in the Middle East, or when he's selling the idea of, why are we in Crimea? Why did we go there? It's on a religious basis. And he points out that the Tsar had Russian ships in the port of Beirut in the 19th century. And he points out to the ancient and very historic links between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Syrian Maronite Church. He points out that Crimea was always a part of Russia. But he does it with a religious imperator. So he knows that to appeal to the Russian public, he's got to have the church on his side. And I absolutely do agree that the Russian Orthodox Church is one of the keys that he's using to legitimize uh, whatever activities the government is doing. And he's doing that in conjunction with traditional allies of the Russian Orthodox Church, which include, for example, a great deal of Eastern Europe, for example, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, many others as well. So it's an excellent uh, point that you're making. Sir. My name is Casey. I'm from Coastal Carolina University. Um, it seems like uh, where Russia is, sorry, I literally just came up. No, no, please, please. Seems like where they have a long term vision, mm -hmm. they draw from sort of a, a com comparison of their various cultures right. to find a common stream that they draw yes. forward. And it seems like because we have so many different cultures here, mm -hmm. that could be quite a strength, that we don't have that common thread always. And so it seems like it makes it more difficult to draw that long term vision. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on how to go about Thank you. Something like that? Right. I mean, first of all, I agree with your analysis. I, I think the challenge is very clear that Russia has a much easier task in that sense. Although what I would note is that even in Russia, because it's a very big country, right, they draw a distinction between, in the Russian language, Rasiski and Ruski. So Ruski is what we think of as an ethnic Russian, but Rasiski covers a lot more ground, basically, almost anyone who speaks Russian. And that is the, the real key to understanding how Putin wants to expand the great deal of the sphere of Russian influence, because it's not just for Russians. It's for those that are in the Russian orbit and who speak Russian. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is in a Russian passport, you have two columns. One, of course, is it's a Russian passport, but the second column is what they call your nationality. And your nationality, which is something, of course, we don't have, is whatever your, your ethnic group is. It's Hebrewski, for example, Hebrew is a nationality in, in Russia. Now, in terms of ourselves, I mean, I think you know basically better than anyone, Casey, that we represent an idea. So we're certainly, you know, um, I think very good at integrating people from various backgrounds, religions, ethnic groups, and all of that. The question is, as you say, how to capitalize and maximize that strength and turn it into something that we can be persuasive in, uh, in, in terms of being attractive abroad. And again, I think we did that very well during the Cold War. So I think it's possible to, to re-examine and to re-look at some of the things that we did during the Cold War and, uh, and, and recreate them. For example, talking about the different strains of American uh, culture, the most popular program that we had, meaning the United States government in Russia during the Cold War, was what? Yes. Who said that? Yes. It was jazz, exactly right, which is a very American 
kind of music that uh, certainly combines different elements of our own backgrounds and cultures, right? But it is an indication that that was, the, in fact, the reason it was popular. They found it very attractive, that uh, this was this really interesting country that had all these different nationalities and people that uh, created this type of uh, unique uh, contribution to culture. So, yeah, but great question, thank you. Sir. Kind of I, I apologize for having been late. Not at all. But you, you were talking about U.S. government efforts. Yes. And the State Department uh, recently, let's say, reorganized the global engagement. Yes, yes. And one of the criticisms that was leveled at mm -hmm. the previous incarnation was that actually the U.S. government mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bearing examples like mm -hmm. uh, the UAE, yeah. Exactly. Another uh, sort of broadcast uh, services is actually not very effective. Yes. So the question is, how, what about identifying and nurturing, let's call them local voices, mm -hmm. and sort of mm -hmm. speak messages, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, sort of from, from local to local, mm -hmm. that would be more effective, mm -hmm. and that would be sometimes informed yes. by some of our values. Exactly right. In fact, I think that's an excellent suggestion, sir. I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm hopefully pointing out, and I, I think I am in absolute agreement with you, is that when I said appeal to the elites, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. I'm talking about appealing to what we would call, and I think you may agree, opinion makers and shapers, right? So I'm talking about people in the societies, as you're saying, that can actually make a significant contribution to the intellectual debate. And it's something that we're not very good at right now at all. I completely agree. The Center for Global Engagement, you know, uh, I, I will say for attribution, is a joke. It's a, it's a pitiful response to, uh, to, to the need that we have to really engage in a lively uh, challenge to, to propaganda around the world. I mean, not just Russian propaganda, but, but ISIS propaganda and other sources. Yes, ma'am. Очень приятно. Well, I haven't had the honor of going to the Valda Discussion Club, but I've been following them very closely. And uh, my sense is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, young people in Russia and in Petersburg in particular have a great deal of knowledge and curiosity about the United States. They do. But at the same time, you know, uh, my sense was that they feel very uh, rejected, actually, and that they feel that, uh, that their own uh, values and their sense of identity is not necessarily appreciated in the West, and, and in particular in the United States. So um, what I found is that they're um, looking, searching for an alternative. And unfortunately, uh, in at least the encounters that I had, they were able to find that very successfully in organizations, as I say, like NASHA, which uh, you know is not a perfect organization, but it offered them a kind of a venue and a sense of identity as, as Russian youth. You know that uh, one of the things we do in Russia, at least we have done, is to encourage a great deal of exchanges, right? So we do have programs that will bring young Russians, principally high school students and university students to the States, to live with American families, to, to kind of um, be exposed to, to us as a society, as a culture. No propaganda value, just being with an American family. But the president, Mr. Putin, said that um, anyone who's associated with those programs is a spy. So, um, you know, now you have to register as a foreign agent, and uh, the programs have been basically shut down. And I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of young Russians that came to the U.S. through these programs. And I'll tell you, they're an incredibly impressive group, really incredibly talented, bright, active and when they came back to Russia, they wanted to do some really great things that, that I recall vividly. So um, it's a 
it's a colossal shame that those programs have ended because it was a forum for us to exchange ideas. And many times uh, the young Russians changed their view of the U.S. as a result of that because they had not been exposed to, you know, what Americans really are like and what they think. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's something that was so successful that uh, the Kremlin did see it as a threat and, uh, and for that reason, you know, shut it down. Talking about illiberal democracy, the reason that Putin gave for shutting the program down was he said that um, one of the students that had stayed with the host family, the, the host father was gay. So that was a, a reason that he offered to, uh, to shut it down. That was, that was enough, besides being a spy. But I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. Yes, ma'am. Another question. Sure. Uh, the way I see diplomacy and public sure. and uh, the gentleman's uh, yes. comment about co-opting of the church. Yes. Uh, there has been a move towards what is now called the multi-stakeholder yes. diplomacy. What is your kind of opinion on mm -hmm. the U.S. government using strengths yeah. particularly with higher education, exactly. popular culture, mm -hmm. technology companies, yeah. and building a much more robust yes. multi-stakeholder model? And mm -hmm. just a suggestion, since you mentioned uh, exchanges, yes. Successful U.S. government uh, cultural exchanges mm -hmm. is the IDLG program, International Visitor Leadership Program, yeah. which brings and has actually yes. fostered world leaders, yes. including the current Prime Minister of <laughs> India, two times. Two times. Yes. And so, what kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, engagement do you have with your IDLG mm -hmm. and globally mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. tap into and exploit that? Yeah. Uh, what he was talking about exactly yeah uh, yeah again another really excellent point i mean one of the things that uh, is clear is that you're right soft power we call it soft power right is one of the most important and attractive tools that, that we have i mean it's true you're right it's not just the government it's absolutely our system of higher education and the fact that we do have this open, accessible society, right, that uh, people can take advantage of, whether it's the Internet, whether it's taking one of those, uh, you know, online courses or participating in, uh, you know, an open forum of ideas, whatever it is, it's extremely important. Now, with respect to programs like IVLP, as you said, the International Visitor Leadership Program, just to explain to everyone, that's a program that targets what I was talking about, the basically the elites of a country up to the age of about 40. So we're looking for the future uh, leaders and entrepreneurs of that society. And, and as you point out, it's often highly successful. What is not successful, as you also correctly point out, having been a veteran of the embassy in Delhi, is that um, we don't do a good job of staying in touch with them. So we do a very bad job of capitalizing on what happens to those leaders after they come back to their countries. And that's true in India. It's true also in Russia. But in Russia, the case is more complicated because they are perceived then as a foreign agent. And, you know, they're reluctant, frankly, to come to anything associated with the embassy or to be associated with anything that has to do with the U.S. government. And they make that very clear to us, and I don't blame them. So we have to find another uh, forum. You're right. We have to think creatively. Uh, we want to keep those kinds of people definitely, you know, uh, in, as, as the professor pointed out, as a resource uh, for for. Uh, engagement with a society that offers an alternative, you know. But it isn't as easy as just keeping a Rolodex and, as you know from your job, uh, you know, DRS, they used to call it and all that, right? It's, <laughs> I know I'm talking about things that are very close and near and dear to your heart, but the point is that um, we, you know, we need to come up with new and creative uh, solutions to um, better harness the talents and energy of those individuals who return. Modi is a great example. I mean, here he is. He's gone on to be prime minister and has established really excellent relations with the U.S., but I think that's more the exception, unfortunately, than the rule. And uh, and you're absolutely right. We need to do far better at that. So, okay, well, I mean, I am very delighted to uh, stay and answer any questions that anyone has, but uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and your interest in a subject that I think is going to be important in your lifetimes. So, um, you know, we're not going to be able to cover all the ground today, but I think 
if we're starting a debate, that's, that's what's important to me. And it's a debate that involves all of you because it's going to be in your interest to understand that we have a significant task ahead of us in terms of dealing and confronting with uh, a very clear, you know, propaganda, um, um, uh, you know, war that's going on, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not. So thank you very much. Thank you.